So when we had the coffee hour last spring, we talked about uh, we were going to go through a process of renewing the finance and admin strategy. So that's our uh, main purpose uh, today. Uh, and I have Ed, Tim, Al, and Lise are going to uh, participate in presenting different parts of the uh, strategy uh, to you. So. So we're a very uh, diverse group in finance and admin. There's 11 departments. I don't know, there's 300 odd employees, probably that many more contractors that work for us. Uh, it's not my line, it's somebody else, but from cops to jocks to bean counters and everything in between. Uh, so what we're trying to do, if you remember, for those of you that were at the coffee hour last spring, we asked people to stand up, shut their eyes and point north, and people pointed 360 degrees. There was a big variety. But the idea of this strategy, the finance and admin strategy, is to try to find a way for us to get on the same page and to work together and to have a common uh, set of understanding objectives uh, to work on. So that's sort of underlying this. That's the purpose of the finance and admin uh, strategy that we're going to talk about. Following over the summer, the, uh, the directors went through a process of uh, some call them directors, people that report directly to me, a uh, process of uh, revising the strategy. Uh, and then uh, Cindy and the Office of Quality Initiatives went out and consulted with, I don't know, most of the people in finance and men, I think 280 together, and we got a lot of feedback. And so there's been modifications made um, based on um, all the feedback we received. Uh, so what we're going to do today, it's sort of like we're in three parts. Uh, one is we're going to talk about the finance and admin strategy. Uh, it's going to be a participative effort between the five of us. And then I'm going to talk about the key initiatives for 2012-13. And then we're going to open it up to questions. Now, we did have one question that was sent in. Uh, but if you uh, think of any others while you're here today, uh, we're uh, set up to handle it at the end. So this is the, uh, the process that we went through over the summer to uh, land at the uh, coffee hour today. So let's start with our um, vision statement. So this is what we come up with, with what we aspire to be. This is what we're striving towards. Working collaboratively, embracing new technologies and innovative ways of operating will provide best in class service to the Carleton community. So as you read these things that you're going to hear me talk about and hear my colleagues talk about today, I'd like you to sort of get in your mindset, does this actually work for me as an individual and in my role in finance and admin, right? So that's what we're trying to achieve with this. Next, our mission statement. This describes, you know, why we exist today and uh, what we do. And I uh, think of this, if I want to paraphrase this, we're all here actually to support the academic enterprise, right? And we all have a role in doing that, but that's sort of, and if I wanted to paraphrase what our uh, mission statement and our purpose here is at Carleton. And then our core values. What's important to us? What are our common beliefs? What are our common values? So we have the six points. And I'm actually not going to read them, but uh, there was one um, in the feedback we had under it's called inclusive decision making. We collaborate in the evidence-based, timely, effective decisions. There was a question around what does evidence-based mean? One of the uh, sort of a early business gurus, a guy by the name of Edward Deming, I know most of you probably haven't heard of him, but he uh, was an American who helped rebuild the Japanese industry after World War II. The uh, most sought after business prize in Japan is called the Deming Award. He uh, had this, well anyways, he, he was probably one of the first people uh, in the world actually to recognize the importance of the customer. He's dead now, but he wrote a lot of books in the 50s and 60s, 70s. Uh, anyways, he has a great quote which uh, supports this, which says, in God we trust, all others bring data. Um, and I think that's, to me, that's what evidence-based means. You know, we want to, we want to assess our customer performance based on asking our customers what they think. Uh, we want decisions based on data and facts, not on hearsay. And so that's what evidence-based means in that context. And if you have 
So anyways, that, that came up a lot in the focus groups that Cindy had, and so I just wanted to speak to that. And hopefully the rest is uh, self-explanatory. Now, we are, um, I think as you all know, the, the balanced scorecard that we use as the basis of our planning, we have four quadrants, our customers, stewardship of resources, the way we work, and our employees. So within each of those uh, quadrants, we have objectives. Uh, then we have initiatives to achieve the objectives and we need to develop, which we has not fully fleshed out as of today, is the ways we're going to, things we're actually going to measure to see if we've achieved that. So each of the four panelists are going to take a turn walking us through each of the quadrants. So Ed is going to start and talk about the customer, okay? So I, I've been elected to be the spokesperson for customer, our customers, and customer service. And as Duncan said, um, we're a diverse group of services. He did say there were 300 odd people. I'm not sure if he was getting at me with the odd comment, but anyway. Uh, we certainly are in a diverse group for everything, CCS, human resources, ORIP, if I have to list them all, I'll forget somebody, um, housing, we do a lot. But we're all in the customer service industry. And our biggest customer, well, it happens to be our student, our undergraduate and graduate students, but we also have faculty and staff. We also have visitors. And everyone in this room is in the customer service business, but you're also customers of somebody else. You also serve somebody else. And some are fortunate to actually serve the customers very directly on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of us are behind the scenes but we're only one or two steps away from the customer. So what we want to do is provide quality, responsive, and helpful services. And this is the feedback we're getting from you as uh, members of finance administration. That's what we want to do, and that's part of our service mentality. We also want to understand the customer needs, and we do that through surveys, and ORIP do a major survey each year for our services, along with some others. But we also look at others, Cusk and uh, Nessie. And we also get to listen to our customers every single day. And if we're not listening to our customers every day, I think we're probably doing them a disservice. They provide us with the best feedback on a daily basis, and then we can react. We also want to look at their um, future needs. The demographics of the population is changing. We know they're becoming more needy as they get younger. For those in housing, housing, you can attest to that one. Others in counseling and health services can also see that. So we actually want to be able to be proactive in meeting those needs. Uh, we also want to foster a culture of service excellence, which was launched um, probably 18 months ago, two years ago. And that's really our providing us standards that we will actually live up to, the professionalism, the caring, the individual uh, service that we want to provide. And again, we focus on the graduate and undergraduate because there's, the numbers are there. But again, we also have to look at ourselves as service-oriented folks. And we also are customers of somebody else. We also want to provide a safe and respectful uh, campus Safe, not just from the perspective that Al will talk to, but safe in that we as employees can provide feedback and information to each other, and it's treated in a respectful manner. So customer service isn't just that one part of the transaction that deals directly with the student, but actually deals with everything that we do. So if you're not dealing with the customer, you're dealing with someone who is and we're trying to support the actual um, service excellence and providing a, a framework to provide a wonderful student experience because those students go out and they actually do our job of recruiting other students. We want them to be successful in their careers. We want to have them actually respond in a respectful way to us, but we also want to be able to provide them with a second to none experience that they will actually tell their other friends and other institutions, here's what Carleton is 
different, and here's why I'm attending. And they become our great ambassadors, as we are ambassadors in the city, to talk about the services that we provide. They are very different, and they are very, I would say, intimate for some and others. It's occasionally you might get the parking ticket, but that's part of the service of actually providing parking on campus. We provide, as Duncan says, the food on campus. We provide the residents. We don't enter the classroom, but we get them to the classroom door. And we, as individuals, we're part of that solution. So our customers are one of the most important parts of the uh, balanced scorecard, and we require everyone to pro provide wonderful customer service and for the most part that's exactly what our students are telling us are we there yet we're probably still on that journey journey it's a continuous journey of customer improvement and really our service excellence uh, model that we're following will help us get there and that's about it on customer service and if there are no questions I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Tim Sullivan, who's got all the numbers. Actually, no numbers today. I'm talking about something totally different. Stewardship of resources. Uh, Cindy came to me a few weeks ago and said, you know, Tim, people don't understand what that is. I said, neither do I, but I can make it up as good as anybody else. <laughs> so you have Google, which helps. <laughs> um, and there's all kinds of definitions out there, right? You know, there's planning and management of assets and all kinds of stuff, there's hundreds of them. What it really is, is, stewardship means taking care of, and your resources is your stuff. So you're taking care of stuff. Write that down now, taking care of stuff. That's what the whole thing is about. And often when people see this very daunting term, stewardship of resources, they think, well, that's not my problem. That's the president's and vice president's problem. But it's not. Taking care of our stuff is all our, is all our problem. Or issue, I wouldn't necessarily call it a problem, but it's, a, it's, it's, our, it's our task. Um, so going through the university's resources, we have a lot of resources, but I'll just go on five, five main ones. Uh, being the finance guy, I'll put finance first, of course. But so our financial resources. So at a high level, the university brings in and puts out a lot of money every year. So at a high level, the president and vice president of finance in my office have a responsibility to our stakeholders, be it the board, the students, the federal government, provincial government, the donors, to use that money in a prudent way. and. Uh, we do that by presenting budgets and, pre and presenting financial statements that are audited and whatnot. But that's only part of the deal, really. Everybody here, or not everybody, but most people here have some role in that. Almost every faculty member has a research grant, and they're responsible for being stewards of that resource to follow those guidelines. A lot of you out there have responsibility for your operating budget. Well, if you overspend your operating budget, we look bad to the board type thing. So everyone is involved with that. Uh, the second resource is human resources. We have a lot of faculty and staff here, as we know. Um, at a high level, our main goal is to recruit and retain the best possible faculty and staff that we can get. Simple as that. But going down, once again, into the organization, we all play a role in that in the sense that we've, a lot of us have, are involved with recruiting people, uh, interviewing them and hiring them and whatnot. And we're all involved with retaining people in the sense that if you make it a good place to work, and that means having good colleagues and whatnot, you're more apt to stay at the place. Um, the third one, which is the big really, the one who understands is the physical resources. The university has a lot of buildings, a lot of equipment, a lot of land. And I would submit to you that every single one of you is a steward of that resource in some way, shape, or form. I mean, Duncan and the president are responsible for the overall planning of the, of the campus and the maintenance of the campus and making sure that the board's aware of deferred maintenance issues and whatnot. But every single one of us has something. We have an office, we have a desk, we have a chair, we have a, we have a pen, we have, you know, you have something, you have a uniform that is the university's and you're a steward of that. In other words, you're supposed to take care of that. In other words, you can't go sell your desk chair because you need the money. You, it, uh, at least I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try that anyway. Um, information resources. The university has lots of data, uh, and I think in terms of, if, if we've been reminded of that with FIPA, that data is a very interesting resource to have. Um, we have to have security in our system, so CCS is certainly responsible for that. And we also, what, what, what has to permeate through the organization is that 
some data you shouldn't be keeping and some data you should be keeping because if you're going to keep it, someone's going to have access to it. So that's one of the uh, bigger risks, if you want, with, with having all this data. The fifth and final uh, stewardship uh, item that I have here is environmental stewardship, which the buzzword these days is sustainability, but this, it really is environmental stewardship. So the senior administration is, is, is committed to that, as, as we've seen. But the university's also put in lots of financial and physical resources into this. So you've seen all over the place the recycling stations, which are very, very convenient and very neat. Uh, we have at least one water, billing, water bottle filling station. I don't know if we have at the gym, I don't know if we have any other ones, but that's a, a sustainability uh, issue as well. But I think that one, getting right down to the grassroots, is that as, as stewards of our environment, forget about the university, as stewards of our environment, we have a duty to use these recycling stations and, um, and uh, as they're meant to be. The second thing we have here is managing risks that affect the university. Now, a lot of the things I just mentioned are, are in fact, risk management items, but, but uh, the university is a pretty busy place. It's like a small town during the day. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. And when you do stuff, you attract risk. I mean, it's as simple as that. If you sit back and don't do anything, it's not too risky. But as soon as you start doing things, you attract risk. And the university has all kinds of things going on. They have field trips in, you know, in, in Africa and, and people up north in the, uh, the tundra and whatnot. Um, and really, risk management is really a common sense type idea in the sense that you don't do things that are really, really risky. Or if you do, you try and, and, and mitigate that risk. But it's good to be reminded of to use your common sense once in a while, which is why we have a risk management function at the university and a risk management guide that would help you guide you along with what you're trying to do. So I think what to take away from this one is that if you're planning something that seems to be out of the ordinary, keep risk in mind. Say, is this something happened here? I'm planning a field trip to Libya. Something could happen there. <laughs> so keep that in mind. And maybe you shouldn't go. I mean, you know, I don't know. That, 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 that's a good example. To, but just when you're doing anything, keep it in mind. And if you, if you aren't sure, check the risk management guide. And if you aren't, really aren't sure, phone Tony Lackey, and he'll be able to give you a two or three hour lecture on how risk management is. <laughs> so on that note, I'll pass it on to Al. So Ed talked about um, our clients and the fact that we need to focus our services on providing the best services to our clients. And, and Tim, he talked about uh, our resources and the way we use our resources. So I think that the way we work is all about that. It's, it's how do we provide the services that we're providing to our clients and use the resources that we're using um, to the best advantage of everyone. How do we take a look at the way we work and make sure that we're providing the best possible service. Um, our first point here is utilizing effective strategic and operational planning in support of the academic research and administrative enterprise. Uh, enterprise was another one of those words that in our focus group people had a little hard time gathering what it was. And I think if you, if you looked in a dictionary, and most of us will remember dictionaries, those are those books with words in it before there was Google and before there was uh, Wikipedia. Um, it really talks about a, a, one of the definitions being a unit, an economic organization or activity, especially a business organization. And I think in this case that in enterprise we're talking about the business that we conduct in each er one of those areas. And I think uh, when we start looking at our uh, providing effective strategic operational planning in support of those, we, we went right back to the basics. As was mentioned, we took a look at our vision, our mission, our values, and started with that again, because those really give us the focus on how we're going to move forward and how we're going to plan. And I think that it's important as we go through the planning process, as we move it through our divisional planning down to our department planning, that it, we really involve all levels of our staff in that planning process. So from the, the management teams to the people who are doing the jobs, it's important for all of us to be involved in that because that really gives us uh, a better understanding of the plan that we're putting out there and better buy-in, uh, better chance of success when all of us are involved in that. When we talk about working collaboratively, that's, that's really important. If we're going to be effective, we have to be able to work together to provide the services that we're providing. And this means communicating better with each other, uh, getting rid of some of those silos that may exist between our different departments and making sure that we work together towards that, building stronger relationships with each other so that we can work better together, knowing the people in the different departments that we have to deal with so that we can understand what their needs are as we're providing services and how they can assist us in providing services as well. 
building those great working relationships, as I mentioned, within our departments, but also very important from the department to department, and also for the other areas that we work with, whether it's the agencies outside of our organization that we deal with, or whether it's the other parts of the university that we deal with. And then finally, continuously improving our processes and services in an efficient and effective manner. And any organization that wants to succeed has to continually review what they're doing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on an annual basis, to make sure that we're doing it the best possible way that we can, that we're getting the most effective use of our resources, and that we're continuing to improve as we go through this. Um, best practices are that. It's what we learn from do, looking at what we do. It's what we learn from talking to others. It's what we learn as we go through our day-to-day -day, uh, processes to um, improve the way we do it. And who better to ask about the way we do something than the people that actually do it. So we should be talking to all staff in this and asking, how do you think you can improve the way you do your job and how can I assist you in doing that? And uh, if I'm working, talking to somebody who's a coworker with me, I need to understand what they're doing because perhaps what I'm doing, I can adjust just a bit to make their life a little easier and provide a better service as well through that. We're really lucky here at Carleton because we, has, we have um, uh, quite a few resources available to us to assist us through that. Um, this is a school of learning, obviously, so there are people out there who are professionals that we can tie into. But also, we, also, we have our own Office of Quality Initiatives that, uh, if any of you have had any dealings with, is, is a, a tremendously helpful, successful area that can provide us with some services to help us review how we do business. So if we're talking about our students are our end goal and the services we provide to them and we want to take a look at the best resources, how we can use those resources properly, the way we work is a very important way of, of ensuring that the processes we do, the work that we provide uh, is improved on a, on a daily basis and moves towards our end goal of providing services to our clients. I want to follow up here with the use of the word stuff with uh, Tim. Stuff in terms of the stewardship of resources. Well, the most important stuff in the fourth quadrant is our employees, and that is each and every one of you. And the four objectives, uh, the first one being providing a safe, healthy, respectful, and supportive work environment. Um, how do we accomplish that at Carleton? I think it starts with each and every one of you. Each and every one of us brings values and behaviors to the workplace as individuals and leading by example in terms of how we display these values and behaviors is very critical. It's also how the university ensures that we have the appropriate policies and programs and committees in terms of ensuring the safeguarding of a respectful and supportive workplace. Um, it's also found in how we provide services to employees in terms of either employee assistance programs, healthy work uh, workplace programs, etc. And it's by engaging our employees in the way that we did in the validation of our uh, mission, vision and values uh, and the work that Cindy Taylor in the Office of Quality Initiative does fabulously in terms of facilitating those validation exercises. I understand most, if not all, units in FNA did validate these statements, and so that is creating engagement, and engagement as individuals and as teams is so important to the critical success of a strategic plan like this one. They do need to become living statements. They need to become, what do I have or what do I obtain when I come into work each and every day, and what can I offer this institution each and every day? Uh, the second objective is developing a culture of continuous learning and Al was mentioning we are a learning institution and so we have in the past offered many learning and development opportunities through a learning calendar and we are in the process in HR right now of revamping and updating that calendar and are hopefully uh, going to have this out on the website in the next few weeks. Uh, in terms of an offering to you on training and learning initiatives, and so watch for that. And we also offer, and we're very good at doing this actually, many career development opportunities that cause for development and growth. And my staff this morning were sharing with me that in 2011, we did have 27 career development opportunities that were posted in terms of job opportunities for either development and or advancement. 
And so that's certainly a way that we um, ensure that we meet this objective. In terms of the consultation process, I should add that some of you, when you were asked about these objectives, mentioned that uh, measurement is certainly something that some of you are hoping to see in terms of how well we're doing delivering the learning uh, activities. And as well, some concrete employee development plans. And so things that we certainly will focus in on as we improve this for the future. Uh, the third objective is recognize and engage employees in their work. And so how do we do that one? So certainly through the Employee Recognition Awards, and we're very good at doing that as well. I've been in many other workplaces where I've never seen activities that are so real in terms of the annual recognition award process that we do around the month of June with Employee Appreciation Day. And of course, in the last 18 months or so, uh, the Service Excellence Awards, for which the nomination process was recently held, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the luncheon is planned for February 7th, right? Okay, so hopefully you'll all attend this. Another way that we do recognize and engage employees in our work is by obtaining and providing regular feedback to your employees and your employees, the employees to their supervisors, and how well we're performing here. How well are we doing our work and how well are we functioning as a team? Very important element. And HR is currently looking into best practices on performance management programs and tools that are out there with a view to improve our own PDP process in the year to come. Um, it, it, the engagement part of this is particularly important. Now I'd like to know how many of you, with a show of hands, attended the Capital Hoops Classic game two weeks ago? All right, okay. Well, it was my first attendance. And thank you, Duncan, for the tickets and the t-shirts. That was great. Now, what happened for me there, I hadn't been able to attend last year, and I was bowled over by how Carleton University won this, not in points, but we won it in support and team engagement for those basketball teams. Ottawa U wasn't even on the map in this game. So it really impressed upon me how valuable the sense of community spirit is really here and how important that is for our customers, the students, and how as employees we can engage in supporting that. And we had a fun time. I saw some of the HR staff attend with their spouses and their children and it was a really fun evening. So I encourage all of you to attend next year because I think that's a real source of engagement. And I actually suggested to Duncan that he should make this compulsory for any AVP or director joining in terms of our orientation program, because it was a great evening. The fourth objective is developing leadership capacity. So how do we do that? Uh, we're currently in HR uh, and with a committee working on a revamped approach to leadership development at Carleton. And so a working group has been formed under the leadership of Cindy Taylor. And we're in the process uh, of having participants who are on this work team carry out interviews in the community on leadership development, what that means, what that could be for staff, and ensuring that our program is one that when we do design and deliver it, that it's made for Carleton and has a Carleton focus on it. And so that is a very important element of moving forward in terms of leadership development. And leadership development is also not just found in the senior supervisory ranks, but at every level. And I personally was particularly impressed with how the lean initiatives have caused for people to become engaged and empowered in how we can improve the work processes that we use every day in our work lives. And I, I know that graphics, for example, uh, FPM and HR as well have participated in reviewing our work processes. And uh, the sense of ownership and engagement that I saw resulting from these initiatives and the power that we gave employees to take hold of their own work with a view to improvement was actually quite amazing. Now, these are the four objectives. And just to remind you that as every leader is working on their own scorecard for each unit, we are all asked to develop particularly work, specific work objectives for each of the four quadrants. And so these are work in progress. They're continuously, hopefully, improving every year. And um, they evolve to better meet the needs of the community. 
Uh, and that's my part for now, and I'll turn it back over to Duncan. Thank you. So that ends the part about the finance and admin strategy. So I just have a, um, a few minutes left, but I'm going to first talk about, so these are the things that are key priorities for me uh, in 2012-13. Most of the things that are on this list uh, you would have heard about already from uh, one of the four panelists. Um, Ed talked about customers, so we're going to continue uh, to support and promote service excellence and uh, measuring customer satisfaction with the services that we provide. Under stewardship of resources, there's a couple things there that are um, that Tim didn't talk about, so I'll just explore them or talk about them in a little more detail. One would be uh, not business as usual. I think we're at a, for those that would have come to the town hall meeting before Christmas, in, uh, in financial terms, I think uh, we're at a bit of a uh, turning point. Um, and it's uh, driven by the uh, provincial government. Uh, the provincial government controls the revenue of the university. Uh, the Ontario government is, uh, extremely financially challenged. You know, I don't know what the number is. They have a 16 or 17 billion operating deficit. Each one of us has a part of the $15,000 as our individual share of the provincial debt. Um, something needs to happen. Uh, and what uh, the provincial government is going to do uh, in the next budget cycle is a big unknown at this time. but. Uh, I really don't see how the Ontario government can continue to spend money the way they have for the last decade. Now the Premier keeps saying that health care and education are going to be spared these budget cuts, but uh, it's hard to imagine that happening actually. But uh, So I, part, part of what I see my job being is actually is ensuring at least everyone, but particularly the leadership team at the university is aware that uh, it's probably not business as usual as we've known it for the last decade. Pension plan is our biggest financial challenge we have. You know, the Carlton plan is 50 years old, I think. Um, it's actually moved along and it's performed admirably uh, for the pension promise or the pension, you know, the pension promise the institution has to employees. Uh, but there are two things going on in the world around us now that make the plan very challenged. And one is the long-term interest rates being at historic lows and persisting there, and the turmoil in the international markets. We've had two uh, financial crashes in the last decade, the high-tech one of the early 2000s and the one in the fall of 2008. And it's really hard to predict how uh, the euro crisis is going to unfold. And so. The plan's very challenged, uh, and we need to uh, continue to think about how we can, uh, what we can do about that. Uh, the other one I'm going to talk about on here is explore the development of the North Campus. Uh, we have 18 acres, I think it's parking lot 7, uh, the area north of the uh, Sunnyside entrance and between the railway track and Bronson. Um, In the late 90s, we actually um, took a proposal to the board to develop this commercially. Uh, the board at the time decided that they didn't want to do that, that they wanted to preserve it for uh, academic purposes sometime in the next 50 to 100 years. So we are just actually going to go back to the board this spring with a proposal once again to develop it commercially. Um, if, uh, so it's not clear to me that the board's going to agree to it. <laughs> But um, if they do, it'll be a, like a five to ten year project that will generate, I don't know, 40 or 60 million dollars for the institution. But it would means that we would be uh, giving that land up for non-academic purposes for ever, actually, really. So that's a uh, big project that we have underway. The way we work, I don't think there's anything in there that isn't self-explanatory that we haven't talked about and similarly with our employees well the two things at the end there the uh, healthy workplace initiative uh, it's Ed, but led by Ed and a group of people in the room are involved with it I know uh, I think we want to continue we will continue to support and promote this and similarly our quality journey PEP level 2 Last spring at the coffee hour, we actually received our PEP Level 1 certificate. Uh, we will spend 
a fair bit of effort over the next year preparing ourselves for PEP level two, which should happen about uh, 15 months from now. So that's an important uh, event. Where do we go from here with planning? Uh, well, we need to uh, finish on our uh, on the balanced scorecard, uh, identifying how we're going to measure that we're successful. Uh, so we need to uh, come up with the things that we're actually going to measure next year. Units will be asked to complete their individual departmental scorecards. We'll go through probably our traditional budget process in March, uh, which will result in us taking ancillary and operating budgets to the board in April. People will actually be asked to refine their operational plans based on whatever comes out of the budget process. And um, those we will uh, share with uh, everyone in the uh, division again. And then we will monitor and assess our actual performance and uh, measure the things that we decide that we're going to measure uh, on our scorecards. There was one question that was asked, and uh, if there's others, uh, think about them. I'm going to ask you to do it in a minute. The question that was asked is, uh, will management wages be frozen again by the Ontario government for another period of time? Well, that's a good question. The Wage Restraint Act came into effect for non-unionized employees in March of 2010. That was a two-year period, so it'll expire in uh, March of 2012. We don't really know what uh, Dalton hasn't called me for advice, uh, but the, what we're hearing is is that it will not continue. So we're expecting that it will just lapse and uh, fade away, and uh, it will be back to uh, the way it was before the Wage Restraint Act came into place. So we're not it's not 100% certainty around that, but it uh, the message that. Uh, we and others have given to the provincial government is you need to do one of two things. If you want to freeze compensation, you want to do it for all the broader public sector, unionized, non-unionized, but don't do what you did last time, which is actually penalize, which has probably ended up at Carleton and most organizations, there's like 8% of the employees have had their compensation frozen and 92% haven't, right? And so, so I seems to be the way they're going to land is just to uh, let it fade away but uh, we don't we'll probably know about this with certainty uh, when the provincial budget comes out at the end of march yeah. so i had a couple of uh, things in uh, just wrapping up um, first i just want to thank you all for uh, coming out today and thank you all for participating in the development of this strategy because it's absolutely critical that if we're going to be successful with this, that you all see yourselves in it and you all feel that you've had an opportunity and have contributed to it. So thank you for doing that. I actually also want to thank Cindy Taylor for doing such a great job of getting us organized today. So thank you, Cindy, very much. And. Lisa mentioned it in her comments. I'd just like to remind you all to come out for a free lunch next uh, February 7th, the Service Excellence Luncheon Award. Um, we had, uh, I'm not quite sure, we had a big binder full of nominees this year. I think there was like 120 or 130 people were nominated. Um, it's actually I don't know, it's, it's just, uh, if you're actually having a down day and you have an opportunity to read yourself, read through this and see all of the great things that people are doing on the front line, it's uh, very rewarding. It just makes you feel good reading about it. So it would be wonderful if you can come out and uh, share that experience with the nominees and the winners next week. So I'd encourage you all to come and participate in that. And lastly, um, if you have any suggestions on how we could make this coffee hour better in terms of uh, organization, time, or content, um, send Cindy and I an email, okay? And uh, we'd be delighted to have your feedback. So unless somebody thought of a question, we're finished. No questions? Nope, so we're done. So thank you very much, everybody.